And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, a man behind way, way, way too many... Way too many one sh one shot and sim and similar projects. The mercenary of tabletop, <laughs> the man better known as Notepad Anon. Hello, everyone. My name is Notepad Anon, and I write games for fun. There we go. We did the catchphrase. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Mildro. It's nice being in the temple. Thank you. For, thank you for coming on, and thank you for having an e a relatively easier set of time zones to work with. <laughs> That's yeah. That's good. See what what everyone doesn't see is the forty five minute conversation before this. <laughs> uh, but hey, we don't need to talk about that. See. Yeah. Well, normal. Yeah. Normally, I have a few bullet points. I have something of an outline when I do interviews. But with this one, I knew that doing that sort of bullet, doing that sort of outline, because I I don't script I I don't script my interviews, was going was going to be pointless because we are going to derail it pretty damn quickly. Immediately, yes. No worry. Like, I used to. Risk assessment used to be part of used to be part of my day job. So, understanding how, understanding how much risk is going to be, or what's going to likely happen in a situation is stock and trade. So, I knew I knew that things would go off the rails. Be, large, large, because it's no different than when things go off the rails when I do the Valley of the Judge or Geek Watch. Uh, which I, su I suppose I'll ha I suppose I'll have to send an apology one of these days to the Philippine gamer for ripping off his concept of going chapter by chapter on certain books because that's basically I, what we do with that series. Yes, my my poor followers. No, they don't. They don't come for my game design streams. They don't come for me talking about. No, they come for my side tangents as it will inevitably go off on strange conversations about things. <laughs> So uh, we, I am, I am not, I am un, I am not unfamiliar with going on side tangents, but it's glad I'm glad to be here. Glad to finally talk with you. Yeah, um, I only, I only found out the desire for the desire for that because um, somebody had somebody had linked me one, linked me one of your streams and how you had um, <laughs> how you had brought how you brought that up, which is why which is why I was like, speak the devil's name and thus he appears. <laughs> Ah yes, Tidebreaker. Uh, you were actually the one that you posted about it. You, I think you retweeted uh, Butler about Tidebreaker, and I looked into it more. I'm like, I'm curious about it because some another person in my server, uh, another fellow I Argentinian. Want, I do want to clarify something. Yes. Butler claimed that I rev I reviewed I reviewed it. That is not that is not exactly true. Oh. What I did. Around the time around the time that I covered it, it wasn't out yet. All that there was was a de was a demo version. The and um, I covered it in as a one shot in my Valley of the Judge series, which if you if you haven't seen Valley of the Judge is where Z where either Xanatrix or Mo or um, Monarch and myself do a chapter by chapter deep dive of a of a given TTRPG. Or we or we cover a um, we cover a demo or or a or or similar th or similar thing as a one shot, some and sometimes small RPGs as as one shots. We have a kind of three in one rule, and we use Tidebreaker as one as one of the one shots that we covered. As far as far as the full book, I ha I have not covered I have not covered it. Um, I certain I certainly have plans to I certainly have plans to, but not. yeah, Tidebreaker was an interesting yeah. That's pretty much how I got introduced to Tidebreaker was Butler. I think again you retweeted Butler or something or Butler. You popped up because Butler mentioned you, yeah, and yeah. because because I did in, I did interview him. You um, did interview him, okay. I did interview him, and I and I had cov I had covered it. Um, 
I had I had pla I had plans on on bring on bringing him back to do a to do a um putting it into practice with with um how we'd adapt how we'd adapt certain characters since given how, given how a lot of it felt very um shonen battle manga inspired I wanted to put that to the test. I've done I've done a similar thing with Joel the guy behind Heaven or Hell where I I put I um I get I went through the I went through the cast of the Samurai Showdown reboot that we that we got a few years ago and asked, okay, how would how would you adapt how would you adapt this cast into your system? And because that because I was a big fan I was a big fan of Sir Brooks' massive, massive list of character adaptations he did for Hero System before before he before he um Join join the Prowlers and Paragons team. Man. Yeah, no, it's like I, I I've seen the adapt. I've seen various adaptions of like here's how you adapt these characters to this, or here's how you make a legally distinct version of this character in this game. Those are yeah. always my favorite. It's it's always it's always an interesting challenge to do to do that kind of thing. Um, and I've done and it's some it's something I've done before or when we do streams. Um. That are focused on life paths, and it ends up being a, it ends up being a running gag of how long until how long until Xanatrix accidentally becomes a harem protagonist? <laughs> because no matter what, it always happens, and it always happens to him first. Oh, Do not goodness. ask me why that happens; it just does. Even, even in something where you think there's no way you can make a harem protagonist out of this, like it, like say, um, like say Hellas. It ends up happening anyways. As someone who is in uh, a variety of you know game finder servers of a particular bent, I have learned that any game can be adapted to make yourself a harem protagonist. It does not matter the game; it matters the intent. <laughs> well, it's, it's if there like is a system, even, there is a chance. It's not even like we had the we had the intent. It's just the dice gods hate him. <laughs> then again, the dice gods hate everybody. It, in fact, I find them I find them to be a model example of equality, but I digress. <laughs> yes. Um. And I I will I will admit that the the only reason I've the only reason I've hesitated when it comes to tackling when it comes to tackling Tidebreaker is there there are two there are two genres of ga of games. That I will always be a bit hesitant on because they mess with my f my format. Supers games and Universalist games. <laughs> and guess what, Tidebreaker is <laughs> both. It, now, I've uh, I've outright stated that when it comes that both of those are two are two genres that I will not touch in um in in the Valley of the Judged, but the when it comes to universalist games, a lot of a lot of the approach that I do with my reviews is bu is building upon theming, and that's something that's going to run counter to a universalist game. There's a few that there's a few that I want to cover, like say Heroes and Hardships, because it's the it's the first time somebody outside of the outside of the Alderac bubble or FFG bubble has done the roll and keep system since um, Dungeons the Dragoning. And that, and I've I've talked I've talked with the guy behind it, who's a who's a pretty cool guy. The, but the but um, and in the in the case of in the case of supers games, um, I'm I know that if I open that up, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be drowning in in fig in figuring out how to make how to make the power system work for me when I do the character creation. Part of my reviews, and I j and I just stop. Yes, it's what I've realized with generics. I've done a few generic cases at this point of me going over just random generic. I usually can break generic games down into three pretty easy categories. Like toolboxes are the hardest. Those are just like here's a bundle of mechanics. They clap in their hands, do a little jazz hand routine, and leave. It's those are by far the hardest because there's not really anything to work with. It's like I can make anything I want. Ta da! Uh, usually, like the really genre focused ones are a lot easier because there is a genre to it. 
it's like this is super gener generic quote unquote super systems your know, mutants and masterminds and stuff like at the end of the day it's like okay it's or like this is just a cowboy game you can make a lot of different kinds of cowboy games with this but it's you're not going to be able to make an alien you know shooty 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 bang bang game no this is about cowboys six you know six shooters and such my usual like third one i kind of like put it in there is the ones that are uh best way to word it is a uh, larping as a generic system like there clearly is already a system in play like a setting or a very clear idea but we're like you can use it for anything you want but we already have like a very pre-established idea it's tidebreaker is weird because it is that third one there is very much already kind of a very pre-established idea of what it wants to be but it's like you can also adapt this because they have their uh, their their license at the end because they want you to make your very own X Breaker game. Come on, why, why don't you make your own and upload it on itch.io? Put our little logo there, powered by Tidebreaker. Is that what it's? Let me let me see if I can remember what the exact name of their license is because it's there. Like it's very in your face about it and that was one thing i noticed about tidebreaker very early on is they really want you to adapt it they want you to make it so that it is your get quote unquote your game but also make sure that we get credited on your book or make sure that we get credited here and make sure to buy our merch because they do have merch which I find to be a little bit weird, but hey, what do I know? But yeah, they've got a few, like, breaker examples. Like, they have base breaker, suit and tie breaker. They have... I actually have the book of Vance breaker. Do you like Vancey and magic in your tide breaker? Now you can add it! Oh boy! <laughs> I remember when I remember when some when somebody um, home when somebody homebrewed the the um, spheres system to to re -add, to re add the Vancian model and nobody t nobody takes it all that's nobody takes that particular thing all that serious because if you're because why the hell would you want to put the Vancian model in into um, spheres of power <laughs> at when the when the whole when the whole point is for it to be an alternative casting system, that's like it's one of those things that are just odd. But any any game with like here's my magic system, why isn't it like D and D, the the best game, the world's greatest role playing game? And and then I sat and then I'm sad, and, <laughs> but like that's kind of like the strange thing with Tidebreaker. It doesn't really have its own identity in that regard because it wants you to adapt it to do other things but would, it clearly does have its own identity I would I suppose I suppose I could actually liken it to the setting problem that I've ranted about for years with the world's most litigious role-playing game because I've said I've said when it comes to what type of fantasy that is that game is supposed to be there's a issue of shit or get off the pot. Yeah, it's I, I get what you I, I get totally get what you mean there because like D and D has an established setting, but it doesn't have an established setting at the same time. So it has a bunch has of to... bullet points. And exactly. People, I remember. I remember. I remember at one at one point I had posited a, I had posited the question on Twitter. What sense would What sense would it make that that's that's a um chord? Who's who's basically the legally distinct version of Thor? Would ha would still have would still have his clerics have turn undead. And I was I was trying to illustrate the point that that um it do, it didn't make sense that no matter what your choice of God, what your choice of God was you still had you still had turn undead when the gods who would probably have that are are a are think fairly like, small like, minority like Palor and the Palor and the Raven Queen were, are the two are the two that immediately spring to mind. Everybody, mm. everybody else, I feel like I feel like the enemies of that deity would be some, would be something other than undead. And someone tried to do the implied setting about about how it was about how it was inspired from vampire hunters and and the like, and I'm like, 
That's cute. That's cute and all, but none of that is actually in the book. And if it's not in the book, it doesn't count. Yeah, it's. I think that's kind of like one of the things with D and D. But that's like the D and D business model. At the end of the day, they want they want to sell you setting books. They want to sell you this, but you use the same universal system. See, and even back in the day, because you had things like here's Dark Sun. Like so, Dark Sun so was not radically univer- different. It's not even universal. Exactly. That's the problem. Like it, it's like you can use it for anything you want. As long as it's what we want you to play, <laughs> like, it's when very it comes, strange. Um, I look at I look at the whole you can use it for all kinds of fantasy more as an as a more damning indicator that the people advancing that, whether it be designers or players, have a very limited view of fantasy. Oh yeah. And there's a phrase I've used quite a bit in in my work that I call the Tolkien melting pot. Um, in part, and I want to make clear, I've got nothing against Tolkien. I, I love me some Lord of the Rings. I've co- I've I did a whole series covering the various Lord of the Rings TTRPGs on this channel. However, much much like how I am with Castlevania and the Metroid and the Metroidvania cultists, I resent the idea that 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 a particular style of fantasy is what I have to do in order for something to be called fantasy. And this is not a new phenomenon because I remember going on forums and seeing people argue that Planescape is too weird to be fantasy. <laughs> That's just funny to think about. Like, oh, and it's I'm, too weird to be fantasy. And Sorry. I'm like, motherfucker, you run Spelljammer. What are you talking about? Like, See, we want it's... we want to talk about weird. Let's bring that into the equation. <laughs> See, we can't talk about Spelljammer anymore because the fifth edition version was weird. Uh, but fuck the Watsi. <laughs> but that's kind of the how do I want to word this properly? That's kind of the I, I've been trying to figure out what what do you call like the D and D fantasy thing? Because like if you think of like oh it's Tolkien fantasy, like Tolkien fantasy was fairly grounded relatively oh, speaking. You this know is, this you is know. the reason I use the term melting pot. Aside from aside from the fact that melting pots and, and anything fondue related is fucking disgusting, <laughs> but it's the, it's the fact that it is it is trying it is trying to be this pastiche of a bunch of stuff. Because keep in mind a lot of a lot of the things that it's that the apologists I'm just gonna, I'm just going to call them what they are insi- insist are traditions are are just things that Gygax and Arneson happen to be fans of. They were fans of Tolkien. They were fans of Lieber. They were fans of Moorcock. They were they were fans oh, yeah. of um. Geez, why, why is this, why is this, of Vance, um, and that and that carried over into what into what they, what they what they what they ended up making. It was it was never it was never built with a set world in mind. The way say, you can't you can't um. Yeah, I'm not gonna say you can't, but it would be very difficult to set to do gen- to um to do full on generic fantasy with say RuneQuest. RuneQuest is married to Glorantha. It has been since day one. But and all and all the fun and exciting problems that has. It's but yeah, it's I think the thing with people have I I've had people call it class fantasy. Even though I'm like, that's a terrible name for a that's variety a t- of reasons. That's like, a terrible <laughs> name, and I, there, <clears throat> I go, I go with, I go with, pa- I go with pastiche, and I just use, I just make fun of it. But um, this is this has always been the this is always this has always been how I've illustrated the issue to people, because because if the if the claim is that you can use it to run all kinds of fantasy, then. Th- then this particular issue should be able to be overcome no problem. So consider this. The most common way to equip a fighter is sword and board. You know, if, yes, either long, long sword or bastard sword and a large shield. Depend depending on the depending on the edition. There's a there's a there's a few there's a there's a few asterisks that can be put on that, but that's not important. So what if I what if I theoretically want to run a campaign that is set in a fantasy version of um, Japan or India? Where, I know where this is going? <laughs> yeah, shields at, in terms of in terms of the hand in terms of the handheld variety that you that you would see in Europe 
are not a thing in Japan. The closest, it, the closest are those, are those glor are those glorified bits of bits of cover, and the which were which is akin which which is akin to a tower shield made out of wood, but the, but meant to be planted, not meant to be not meant to be carried personally. So that so and because of that, I don't count those as shields. Everybody, you sh you. You can pro you can figure out pretty easily what I what I'm going to mean by shields and what isn't going to count. Yeah, I get you. I get you. But and but the th and the thing is, I know so I know some people might say, what what about those what about those big um what about the the big lacquerware on on samurai armor? Don't those kind of shields? No, no they no they don't because it because it's not it isn't a defensive item that you are carrying on your arm in the in the same vein. Other, otherwise, otherwise, you could you, you could you could say that the ridiculous pauldrons you see in Warhammer and World of War and um, Warcraft are shields, and nobody's gonna win. Nobody's gonna make that argument. <laughs> <laughs> but the but um the the closest that I found was one fighting style in Okinawa that wasn't even using a full-on shield. It was essentially essentially using an improvised um, turtle shell as Kind of like a buckler, and the, and that's the closest you can get. And the re, and of course, of course, of course, somebody could answer. Well, just house rule it. Well, for one, house ruling should be a spice, not the main dish. And I don't know, I don't know about you, but I don't like drown. I don't like drowning my steak in pepper. <laughs> uh, I have very strong opinions about home and that argument. Uh, and how I hate that argument with an unholy passion, but hey. What, the, uh, the, the spice thing I mentioned, or the just no, homebrew it? Just homebrew it, bro. I hate that argument to no end. <laughs> if, my, if I have to use a better, if I have to use a more relevant counter-argument with the just homebrew it, um, Skyrim. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just like, oh, well, if you just homebrew this thing, it gets better. If you just homebrew that samurai have shields, or you improvise there's a shield or something, it'll work. But I'm like, that's not the point. Like, the, that's not the point of this. Yeah, the point. Is, the point is, is, is that the is that the the that particular that particular means of equip of equipping, which I know some people say, well, we'll just don't, we'll just don't do, we'll just don't do that. The problem, the problem is because of how it's designed, you're give, you're putting yourself under a significant disadvantage if you don't, especially especially with the way armor worked in earlier editions. And yeah, it's it's one of those fascinating things that's trying to get D and D to do very certain things. I think fighters see this a lot more, like marshals in general. I think see this a lot more frequently than casters, because casters you can always kind of fluff things differently. Oh well, in my setting, they're rune casters. What does that mean that I draw a little symbol and then cast fireball? Y yeah, I've already done that. Like it's still going to cast fireball. But if it's like, hey, marshals are the ones like very certain equipment, very certain restrictions, and it's like if you aren't playing by that very particular set of rules, or you don't just adapt to those rules to the best of your abilities, or make some like weird build dedicated to it, because if most likely someone will say like, well, my samurai with my masterwork katana, masterwork longsword katana that hurts on nineteens and twenties, uh, yeah, boy. You know, Jamie, pull up the the, the katana copy pasta. You know, <laughs> it's one of the. And you know exactly the one I'm talking about. Oh yeah, about. I know. Oh yeah, I know. I've seen. I I saw that <laughs> thing fucking everywhere. Yeah, but... it's. If you pull up something like that, I'm like, yeah, then it's like, oh, it's perfectly valid then. But then it's like you're, you're missing the broader point of like it is a European fantasy kind of kind of game, and if you try to adapt it elsewhere. It tries to refit it into that mold. Yeah, and um, even, even, and even even spell ca spellcasters can ha can have a similar problem, but but differently. And it comes down to the it, com it comes down to the fact that to to you to use the, to use the Japan example again. The con the concept of the wizard locked up in his tower, surrounded by dusty tomes. 
is not really a thing you're gonna see in mo in mo in most in most in most mythology or storytelling throughout Asia. If in, if anything, the line between martial and and mage is gonna be a, is gonna be a lot thinner. But let's cons let's cons consider this. Before we went live, we talked about L five R. The the preeminent caster in L five R is the Shugenja. The Shugenja, I would I would say it's I would say its analogs would its Japanese analogs would be its Japanese analog would be would be the Onmyunji. Onmyunji were not were not ice were not isolationist. They had they had they had prevalent um, spots when it came when it came to when it came to courtly life, and and a lot of they were they were not too far removed from priests. the The line between a a mage and a priest in in those sorts of settings is Are very more, thin, if if not non-existent. And up uh, and that's so, and. Let's also let's also keep, let's also keep in mind that when you're de when you're dealing with things like animism and sh and shamanism, um, that this idea uh, this idea of I am I am the master of the arcane of the arcane isn't going to be a thing. L L five R had it that you're not casting spells; you're asking Kami to perform a favor for you. Yeah. Um. Of course, and of course, there's also some some analogies that can be made between the Shugenja and the Taoist priest, but the the point is is that that particular concept, which is ver which is very much heavily Im heavily implied, and there isn't it isn't really written with the idea that wizards are that wizards aren't that isolationist, is some is something that's not accounted for. Plus, there's the fact that in different fan in different fantasy settings just in books you have very different means of how magic works um, this is especially the case in everything that Brandon Sanderson does oh goodness but, yeah Brent, Brandon Sanderson's kind of like its own thing but hey stormlight archives is getting its rpg here soon apparently yeah, it is i did see, i did see a tweet that showed what the character sheet was going to look like um I have no idea on how it's going on how it's going to run, but it's very clear it's not going to be falling into the um, the world's most litigious role playing game trap. Um, bes okay. Besides, I get the feeling that after the last time that Sanderson wrote for Wizards of the Coast, he's not in, he's not in any hurry to do that again. Well, all we're going to see is the you know compatible with Five E sticker right on front, and then <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready to feel so sad. <laughs> how? How about, if it if it comes out and it doesn't have that sticker, <laughs> you do realize I will never let you hear the end of that. I'm re I'm ready. I'm ready for it. See, <laughs> at that point, I get to go over it then because it won't have the sticker, so I can just slap it in a franchise case and be happy. Yeah. But like, yeah. I think one of the big things with fantasy is, I think we have. I wouldn't say is like we as a society bottom text have lost fantasy, but I think we've. I wouldn't say drifted away from it or like have problems with it now, but I feel like really think about like the last major like fantasy setting in like movies, books, TV shows, or anything like that. And yeah, it, it's a little bit more difficult to think of something, right? Because it's like, hmm, I, I couldn't, I can't think of anything of the, like right at the top of my head. And someone's gonna say, "What about Avatar?" And I'm like, "No." See, I would say I, well, um, he, well, it would be easy for me to it would be easy for me to bring up, uh, to bring up Harry Potter or or Lord of the or Lord of the Rings, but here here's the thing that's even funnier with that, um, and I I did ta I did talk about this when I was when I was covering how the Lord of the Rings RPGs have handled magic and the one that seemed to do it the best was, um, the One Ring. In com when it comes to when it comes to the whole adapting thing, because unlike the others, the One Ring wasn't a adaptation of an already existing system. Yeah, no, I have all the Lord of the Rings RPG. I'm gonna, I've been meaning to do a case on it. I'm ready to go on it. But people don't vote for it. They want me to suffer more. But um, it the but the but 
both both that and Harry Potter trying to put that into the Vancian model, they utter, they utterly wither in it. Oh yeah. Even even in things such as like Harry Potter, like there is no Harry Potter RPG. There's a few fan ones. Don't get me wrong, there's a few fan RPGs. But then like what I usually see is like there it's a like a PBTA like game where it's just like roll on it and you're making the magic move or you're doing something like that. Or it's like here's a magic point. I see a lot of magic point systems when it comes to Harry Potter stuff. Because I, I recently uh, wrote a I Can't Believe It's Not Harry Potter game, and I was having a lot of trouble with it. It just nothing was literally clicking with it. And... I think I think the prop the the problem that ends up ha the problem that ends up happening is the is the fact that within within the within the source material whether, whether it be the books or the films um there's just there's just about any there's just about any first off you have the issue of a series bible never being written so you don't so you don't really know where the limit is on what you can do with ma with magic and there's so many things that are that you're that are um, view, that are viewed when it comes to doing magic that it's hard that it's hard to it's hard to it's hard to nail down where, where um where the how far the umbrella is supposed to be covering. <laughs> I think that's kind of a a unique it, it, there's a unique problem with tabletop role playing games where you do need. I would say limits, because in the books, even like Harry Potter books, or any of these kind of books, magic occurs because magic needs to happen for the plot, and you see like a character like Harry perform magic and fail at magic even, because, you know, it's like he's not very good at that, but they never talk about it, they never talk about the details behind it, because it's a story, we don't really need to talk about the details, even like, um, and I see a lot of people when they try to adapt certain projects, I see it a lot of time with adaption. Is that it's like we need to now put rules. We need to put the logistics behind it because if we don't have the logistics behind it, suddenly things begin breaking down. Or like it, it was, ne it never talked about limits. But if you have a, if it's completely limitless, characters can do everything. It's like we don't talk about, you know. Um, recently, I'm having to do an anime game where they just do not mention uh, parents. There's there's one mention of parents existing, and I thought about it for a bit, and it's like there are no adults in this setting. Apparently, there's one adult that we actually see, uh, or they're all villains. And I was thinking about it, like I was actually having a very strong debate with one of my, um, effectively the co-writer at this point, about it. And it was like, do we add it in? Do we have to make an assumption on it? And I think a lot of the time when you have these developers adapting things. Like Middle Earth to a you know, five, you know, a middle. Oh, we need to make a Middle Earth game for five E. It's like they don't. Tolkien doesn't really talk about magic like really precisely. He doesn't really because it's supposed to be kind of ooh mysterious and kind of weird. And it's like oh no, Gandalf's doing magic. Oh go oh goodness, bright lights and terrifying you know visages and all that. Decipher actually actually had actually had an interesting um an interesting response to that issue. And that that was the idea that, um, that ma that be magic being ev magic being ev magic being everywhere, but in but but oftentimes in more sub in more subtle forms to the to the point of Im of implying subtler magic effects with just in with just invoking cer certain names, whether it be na whether it be names of the Valar or na or names of. Or, or even just saying um, Sauron's name. You know, the, the whole thing of of using the name could dr could draw could draw attention of things you don't want, um, which cer which certainly fits within what one one of the things that Tolkien was attempting to do, which was br which was bring in a lot of the a lot of the pr a lot of the pre-Christian um, fo um, folklore. Into oh, yeah. into into the mo into the modern age, a lot of the stuff that was that was lost with the conversion to um, Christianity, and I'm not I'm not trying to I'm not trying to say that he was secretly a pagan or anything like that, but that lo but bringing in that lo that lost history, there's a reason why um, 
I, I will always argue that you can't you can't take the British out of out of Lord of the Rings, and why a character like 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 Bombadil is 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 going to be in there since, because that's a very British thing to do. I can guarantee almost everyone Aragorn's original name was going to be Beowulf somewhere in there, and like, uh, because Tolkien was obsessed with those kind of things. He liked that that prehistory. Hell, he's the one who translated uh, Beowulf, uh, which is a fantastic thing. You should everyone should read. He also but, tran he also translated um, Sigurd and Gudrun. Yeah, exactly. A lot of I think he did some Celtic myths too. Just kind of the a lot of translation work and trying to bring in that kind of ancient history. And it's like, how do you transfer that to a game? And like, how how do you transfer a lot of different things that you know in video ga in video games and books and movies and shows or whatever? How do you translate that to a game? It's such a you. The tabletop role playing sphere is a very unique sphere with a lot of problems in it, and everything is on fire constantly because of it. It's well, great, though. <laughs> One one man's problems is is another man's opportunities. Exactly. Because to to say it, I've I've seen some say that you can't that you can't adapt it, and I'm I'm sitting here going, the. I'd be, I'd believe that if I I I would I'd believe that if I hadn't seen it if I hadn't seen otherwise, um, with my own eyes, um, and going back to going back to the magic system thing. Um, it's for this. It's for this reason that if I'm running Pathfinder, for instance, the spheres of power setup has bit has become the default because because it because it actually answers this question by ha by not having a set um, tradition, not having a set magic system per se, but ha but having the means to allow the players and GMs to build that since. How familiar are you with um, Spheres of Power and its and its sister works? Not very familiar. I know again, it's one of those things. Like I know they exist. I know that, but like my one of my issues is like I didn't get into really tabletop role playing through like third edition or anything like that. I got into Warhammer Fantasy role play second edition. That was my first game that I ran with my friends. We ran it very poorly and wrong, but we did play it. Although, and, speaking speaking of adaptation, I will I will tell you a little bit of a story that was that was related to me because I have I have spoken with the I have had um, um, Graham Davis, the designer of of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay First Edition, on, and one of the things one of the things that he had said is that early on. They tr they tried to they tried to bring over the same the same d6 die pool system from fantasy battle into fantasy roleplay. And this did not this did not work. They tried to make it work, but they re but eventually they realized they were painting themselves into a corner and they scrapped it. Um, I don't know. I do I do not know if if um, RuneQuest was what was what they had used as. As the way to get out of it, and that's what led them to do the D100 approach. But it wouldn't surprise me if that was the case. BRP at that point, that would have been that would be early 90s with first edition. If I'm looking, if I'm remembering correctly, I don't have it open. But BRP would most likely be an influence there. But there were a bunch of D100 systems oh, for a while there. Some of them were derivatives, of course, of BRP, but some of them were their own thing. And and. Of course, of course, st stuff like Star Frontiers and um, Boot Hill um, are D one hundred systems, but predate, but predate, um, B but predate BRP. And the reason I mentioned RuneQuest is because RuneQuest and BRP have kind of a similar relationship that Champions and Hero System do, where one where one kind of spun off from the other. Yeah, I can I, I can see that. Like, there's. 19, 1986? Goodness gracious. Yep. God, I thought it was 90. I thought it was 91, but that must have been... <laughs> my time is... Time is ephemeral. I don't know what anything is anymore. Space Keep is warped my... and time is bendable. But... See, that would actually be the first year that Harn World came out. So. <laughs> but the thing... The... It is... Spheres of Power is a alternative casting system to Pathfinder. That... 
takes it takes the it takes the spell charge thing, the Vancy and stuff, and tosses it. And instead goes with a talent based uh, approach. It does it does have spell points, but you're not you you're not necessarily using spell points to um, to boost spells. You're use you're or you're not using them to cast spells. You're using them for certain boostings of of spells because the way the way that it works is each sphere is is essentially its own little loose talent tree. It's not a, it's not as connected as the talent tree you would see in say an ARPG. Yeah, but I'll use the destruction sphere because that's the easiest one for people to grasp because everybody likes the blaster caster. You hit, you pick the destruction sphere. You get a destructive blast right out of the gate. All of the talents within the destruction sphere afterwards are gi are giving you alternate ways to use it because destructive blast on its own is a bl it deals bludgeoning damage to a single target at range, but there are talents to change the area of effect, to change the type of damage, and so, and so on. So if you want, if you want to have chain, if you want to have chain bludgeoning, that's how, that's how it's done. Yeah. <laughs> the that that's one half of the equation. The other half is what's known as the magic traditions. Now, one would think this is how this is essentially how the rules of spellcasting are made, because. It is. It operates on a on a kind of advantage disadvantage setup of sorts, where you're you're essentially putting in boons and banes. So if if say if say in your system, say in your setting, um, you spells have to be spells have to be written down uh, in in runic patterns on some sort of solid surface. That would be the purview of traditions. If you need blood sacrifices in order to do spells, that would be in the traditions. If you need to as far as far as the whole verbal some som somatic stuff if you need that that would be in traditions if you and so and so so on and so forth because because of that you actually can put in a tangible way to sh to showcase okay th okay this is how magic works in the setting and these are the things you have to be mindful of if you're going to be doing casting and the way it works for is for every two banes that you put on it, you get one boon, where you can either give yourself extra spell points or give yourself a certain advantage. Yeah. Well, uh, I've seen. So it's more about some... building building your type of casting, if that makes sense. Yeah. I'm trying to. Yeah. yeah. Um. And there are there are a few there are a few exa there are a few examples that were that were put in the in the in the. Do in the um, in the document, let me let me. Unfortunately, a lot of the stuff that's of it, that they have for it, they have their own they have their own wiki for it. Oh, <laughs> wiki hunting! Uh, once again, wiki hunting is the bane of my existence. <laughs> but okay, let's 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 go with a let's so, let's go with let's go with a bardic magic magic tradition. And the third thing I should note is that even the abil even the ability modifier that's used for casting isn't set. When building the tradition, you pick which of the mental ones, and I've I've house ruled it that the physical ones are available as well because I want somebody to have the option to be a muscle wizard if they want to. <laughs> because as God intended, you know. Because <laughs> um, I ended up running a muscle wizard once who was essentially a essentially an Arnold style bodybuilder. Who, who, um, <laughs> lit, who literally cast spells by flexing? I can respect that. <laughs> he, he, <laughs> the the problem is the the running gag was whenever he would try and cast spells, everyone knew it because his shirt would explode. <laughs> but bardic magic, its its ability modifier is is charisma. Obviously, the drawbacks are skilled casting, i.e., you have to use you have to use a specific skill to to um to use the, to use it. In this case, the skill is perform, somatic casting and verbal casting, self-explanatory in both of those, and and the boon is getting an extra spell point every odd level in casting classes. Um, 
that that's that's one example on how, on how this can work. They made they did make it they did make a joke sphere called Bear as an as an April Fool's joke, where which had bat <laughs> casting bear characteristics. I mean, I'm down. I I would be a bear caster. <laughs> um, is I, it's all it's always funny whenever game designers put in April Fool's jokes just to see what they're gonna come up with. But that that whole that whole issue of of ma of magic system isn't really an issue that you ha that you have within the sphere system, which is why it became the default. And they've since expanded it with spheres of might, which is a martial affair. Um, Champions of the spheres, which is for your gishes, and um, oh, most gish, most um, oh lovely so gish. Spheres of Origin, which is taking the sphere system and putting that same level of customization on races. And most recently, Spheres of Guile, which is do which is doing this but for um, skills. That would be useful, actually. Um, I might have to, I might have to uh, I might have to take a look at those spheres one of these days for a few things I'm working on or things that need some yeah. some help. But the key th the key thing with each sphere is that it is that it, there's a ba there's a basic there's a basic ability or two that you get, and then any if you develop talents further on in within it, that's just customizing what you can do with it. It's there's there isn't a, there isn't a uh, in the case of um, the dis the destruction sphere that I mentioned, there isn't a improved destructive blast or or anything like that because destructive blast damage is going to is going to scale with you. Yeah, and the same I, the same thing goes with healing or other stuff. There isn't a same spell as what came before, just just um with numbers bigger. going up. Yeah, exactly. In, instead, take instead taking the approach of as you're developing, you're 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 not do, you're not getting a you're, you're not getting a boost. You you don't have to pick a boosted version of what you already have. Instead, you're doing more with it. Exactly. Yeah, no, that would be very handy. I could see that kind of being adapted, but even as you say, it's kind of it's kind of interesting. You're kind of talking about that. It's how many books for all these spheres, or how many different things that you need to kind of like add on to it, well, rather than just being in the core kind of thing. Well, when it comes when it comes to this, when it comes to um, sphere power. Each of each of the each of the four main ones that I mentioned, it's not like you. It's not like if you're just using spheres of power, you need might or the others. It's more of the Pick each what of them. You need. them. Each of them has a specific purview. Yeah. Like if you're if you're not going to be using if you're not going to be having skill emphasis in your in your campaign, there's no reason to have. Then you don't need spheres of guile. Um. They. If you and. When it comes and when it comes to champions, I always I always tell people that's an at your own risk thing because, well, for one, any sort of any sort of gish character is al is always going to have a higher floor. That's ju that's just the nature of the beast. And to and this is the the floor is slightly lowered in the ca in the case of champions, but it is still a higher floor compared to just being a straight sphere caster or practitioner. And, yeah, and, I get you. I get you. But the well, when when it comes to adaptation, I I will admit some um, some source materials are e are easier to work with than others. Oh yeah. Um, oh yes. Bo books. I some would say books would be the easiest. Uh, not not in not entirely. Depends some, on the book. Very much depends on the book. With and... with some, I already, with some there's already a there's already a precedent that I can build around, like say Wheel of Time. Like there's already been Wheel of Time RPGs and people t and people taking notes from Wheel of Times for years. So that so that's easy to work with. Um, there's been plenty of people who have who have done stuff with Conan. So that so that's oh yeah. Also <laughs> there's I think there's more Conan RPGs out there than than most things. Um. I it did it did it did tickle me when I saw that Modifus had done a expansion to cover um Cull. Um uh, good old Cull. I, I got Cull comics when I was young. I didn't get Conan comics. And um 
My and of course, there. Even though they don't have the license anymore, there it, there was a Sa there was a Savage Worlds take on Solomon Kane that provides a decent primer of that character. I think when it comes to like, I would say more of the pulpy heroes, things like that make a little like. I think they adapt easier because it's a it's a thing about doing something. If that makes it, it's kind of a weird thing to say, but it's a their stories about. You know, characters doing something. It's you know, Conan is like a kind of an archetypical hero, and it's like, okay, we understand who Conan is. We all know about all his his friends. Or hey, let's adapt the Conan children's cartoon, which has a banging theme, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, out of nowhere, but hey, it works. But then you see things like the uh, Song of Ice and Fire role playing game by Green Ronin a few years back. Yeah. Uh, I love that game. I love it so much I wrote a second edition for it by hand. Mm -hmm. Pain. But even that, that had its own very large plethora of issues. I, re uh, I reviewed that a few years ago. My big issue was that it, it had too many it had too many attributes. Good old skill tributes, baby. It's the weird thing with that, with the uh, Song of Ice and Fire role playing game, is that they clearly knew the source material and you had the house creation system and you had all of that it was just really easy to game and make someone who could not count to five but could single-handedly kill a giant with their fists uh blood of blood of heroes that's how you win every that's how you win in that game you just select blood of heroes and get a seven in something it's it's really interesting though when people try to adapt like i would say I've seen attempts to adapt like bigger and grander ideas. Someone I know have been trying to adapt. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen or heard of the Liminal Horror RPG. I it's have. Made its, it's made its rounds on itch.io, and I look at that. And I'm like, why would you want to adapt? Like, why would you want to make a tabletop game about something that's supposed to be eerie because it's there? Like, no one's doing anything in a Liminal Horror game, or like a setting. I guess I don't. Maybe I'm weird in that regard. I see a, I see some of those sometimes. I see people trying to adapt, like, I want to make a Stardew Valley RPG. And it's like, I get it, but why? Like, <laughs> why do you want to adapt this? Because it's cozy. I'm like, what am I doing, though? Like, what? Yeah, like, that's... What? that's. And and truth truth be told, when it comes... If you want, if you wanted something cozy, what's... What? What it, what in particular about Stardew Valley demands, it demands its own ga its own game with its own system that can't ar that can't already be tackled. And if, and as far as because it's cozy, so is gold so is Golden Sky Stories. What's your point? <laughs> oh, Golden Sky Stories. It's weird diceless system by Ryu Kamiya, a man, the myth, the legend himself, and he, f and I follow him on Twitter and all the weird shit he posts. Yeah. Uh, I but, love you. Uh, but I would s it's I would say vi I would say video games are are a little bit easier because you do have a structure you can you can build around. Oh yeah. Oh, it's oh. I even tell people just like if you want to emulate a game really really look at it. Like really like pay attention to it of even down to little things like how do how do enemies attack? How do you attack? How do you move around? There's been a few Valkyrie Chronicles, uh, Valkyria Chronicles games out there. Mm -hmm. One of them just uses the FFG uh, 40K system, actually. That's pretty much the most well-developed one. Hell, I wrote one. But it's like, okay, this makes a lot of sense. It's effectively a war game with anime girls instead of, uh, you know, burly men looking I, at each other longingly. I call, I it, call it, um, I call it XCOM with less bullshit. You say that. However, when Largo misses his shot for the fifth time, you, you begin to doubt. That. Counterpoint: Long War. True. <laughs> further, further counterpoint: ninety-five percent chance to hit while it while in point-blank fucking range, and you still miss. Ninety-five <laughs> percent chance to hit in XCOM means five percent chance to hit. This is known. Like it's. I didn't. Say, that's that's why I said with less bullshit. <laughs> but it's I think like games are pretty easy to adapt but then I see people like wanting to adapt like I want to adapt Devil May Cry and they put it in 5e it's like no 
don't do that. Stop been, that. Plenty of there's been plenty of games that have had that have that have done a Devil Hunter class. And truth truth be told, I think I think that's a more nat that's a more natural spot than give than doing a whole a whole ass RPG. Um, or you can or you can just play Hunter the Vigil and just play <laughs> literally just play Dante because he's in that game. Uh, I would no I would Hunter actually, the Reckoning. That's it. I would actually I would argue that the if somebody if somebody were to put a gun to my head and say what system should be used for Devil May Cry, the two that come to mind. And I know I, I know I keep bringing them up, but they seem the most natural fits would be um, a heavily hacked Feng Shui. And um, Savage Worlds. I would even say I, I would say even not even uh, Feng Shui. I would say even Wushu would probably be the best. Yeah, but just Wushu, for how but fluid. How it, it's very light. It's very with, light, but it is very fluid. With how uh, with how um with how light Wushu is, there's there's very little that it oh, yeah. that it couldn't do, which is why I didn't, True. Which is why I didn't consider it because it'd be Wushu too solves all problems. Uh, but it's. Or you can use one of my games. Educeus <laughs> Lukes, everyone. Subtle plug. Uh, generally speaking... <laughs> let, me, let me just do a subtle plug right there. Subtle. Uh, yeah, exactly. Subtle as a brick through a glass house. It's... I think even down to emulating or adapting certain games, like, some of them are pretty easy, but then you get things like the Pokemon RPGs, fan RPGs, anyway, that come out, mm -hmm. who go a little bit too hardcore on it. I know things like Pokeroll and Pokemon Tabletop United, you effectively need a full-on, like, Excel spreadsheet to even pretend to play the game, because they emulate every single aspect of the Pokemon experience. And I sounded like Bill Cosby there for a second, then the po Pokemans. Uh, I've seen them try that. That's why I'm, like, in the video about adaption versus emulation. I made a very big point being, like, adaption is good to a point. Like, just trying, not adaption, emulation is good to a point. Because if you're trying to emulate something, you get more personality of it. It's like, this is very uniquely this, but it's like, some things do not transfer over very well. Some things just can't transfer well because of the, of the medium. And, uh, I think some of the Fire Emblem games did that pretty... Fire Emblem uh, tabletop games I've seen, which tried a, a straight Fire Emblem tabletop role-playing game one-to-one -one from the mechanics of the game. That happened, and it was not very good. <laughs> to be honest, I feel that... Fire Emblem, I feel, works better in a... works better in a... in a scenario-centric war game than it does in a role-playing game. That's effectively what one of them was effectively a war game, but you only controlled one unit at a time. You uh, every player controlled one unit, <laughs> and it was very slow and very meticulous. And the calculation to hit had a fraction in it. And it's you look at it, you're like, no one's going to calculate this percent chance to hit every time unless you have it on the VTT. Uh, I, lo but, I lost the I lost the notes for it, but I do remember doing a do, um, testing a war a war game um, take on take on Fire Emblem, and the ma the main test that I was I was doing was just to try and na nail down the fa the famous weapon triangle. the uh, The approach, that, but the approach that I, end I ended up doing with it was. Um, was instead was instead uh, instead of using dice, I used playing cards. And the reason the reason I did that is I want is I intend I intended to have it that you're not that um at that attack actions are meant are meant to resolve simultaneous simultaneously. And if you ha if you happen to have the weapon that would have an advantage, you draw t you draw two cards and use the higher one instead of one. But it was basically and basically any at any attack exchange was meant to be like a what was meant to be akin to the the war card game we all played as kids you know you know pick you know oh, yeah. everybody pick a card in, yeah everybody draw a card two. whoever has the highest wins yeah basically, basically the ultimate strategy is being lucky <laughs> yeah basically make it make make it a make it a snappy affair 
Um, because the the thing the thing with um with doing emulation is that it is I feel it should be more about the spirit and the and the intent of something rather than yeah. to the letter. That's um, why I, I I I broke up emulating versus adapting. Like adapting a game to a tabletop is a very different process. It's like here are the key themes, here are the key ideas. How do we put this in a kind of a unique format versus hey here we're going to take this game and take all of the numbers and put it on the table. Yeah, uh, yeah. I do remember then you get... roasting the Dark Souls Five E attempt, and one, <laughs> one would one would say, of course, of course you did. It, it was using Five E. It's like if if it was just if it was just that alone, I I could say yeah, it's cringe and that, but and that, but nothing more than that. But that but. They ended up creating problems that didn't need to exist. Um, so you're I a man. Mean, of, you're a man of culture. You've pr- you've probably da- you probably dabbled in a Souls like game at least once. Yes. Uh, so I do know. Poise was health effectively, and you had to burn t- health to do everything. <laughs> yeah, they com- for whatever reason they combined health and stamina into position. Poise is a whole is a whole different. Oh thing. god, yeah, no, that was a no. no I'm thinking of uh, the JTRPG version, which is, by the way, not a, also not good. <laughs> like, um, also, there's there's well there's there's mul- there's multiple. T- I have because I, the I haven't I know that somebody is working on translating it, but I ha- but that translation is not finished. I haven't, and I I was told in advance that the official one that Katakawa did um what wasn't very good. No, it is not. I, I have someone who has translated chunks and can speak and can read and everything, and it's oh, it's a generic system, but it is quite literally you play through Dark Souls three, and it's very it's not lethal really. It's just annoying. Like you die frequently, and if the main character dies because everyone else is playing ghosts effectively, you have to restart the encounter. It's a bunch of weird stuff like that, and it's yeah. Those are those are unforced errors. Yeah, um, it's like I get what you're doing here, Katakawa. Please stop. But um, one of the, but some somebody but I I will I will argue that no edition of the world's most litigious role playing game could handle souls for one specific reason. Though that particular, you cannot do souls like. At least that version of Souls like, with a class system. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, with a, especially with like a very, very rigid class system, I would say. A very. What? This is this is the reason why I I half jokingly I half jokingly said it, but I could but there but there is a, there is a bit of truth to it. I could see hacking the the class design that's used in Sword World to make it work. Because oh, yeah. even though Sword World talks about having classes, in the traditional sense, it doesn't. They're they very are, different. Pa- they, they are, are they're skills. <laughs> like yeah, they're packages of skills and ideas. Mm-hmm. It's probably one of the games that I saw do this really well was Fires Far Away. I don't know if you've ever uh, talked about Fires Far Away before. I haven't but... talked about it, but I am aware of it. Yes, Fires Far Away. I went over that one. That was really good. It uses a stamina die system to... You pretty much are spending certain numbers of die, and you're spending kind of values of the die to action, do actions, to dodge, do a bunch of different things. But one of the ideas is you start with the class, but you can kind of develop in any way you want. It only kind of gives you your starting gear, starting stat line. It's kind of like the game in that regard. You may start as a knight, but you if you want to spec into sorcery, nothing is going to stop you from specking the sorcery. It'll just be a little bit longer. Yeah. And, hey, you're playing a sorcerer. Please invest in health, because you will die immediately, because you're a squishy little little noodle boy. Mm-hmm. Please suppose, get more stamina. I suppose if, there, if I have to use a class system, pro- the closest I could think of would be something like Against the Dark Master. Yeah, I could see that working. It's... Because it has a class system, but it's but it's more of how mu- how much can you invest in certain in certain areas rather than rather than it's rather than a more um, res- a more strict class approach. Yeah, something a little bit more amorphous would be ideal in almost every situation yeah. when it comes to like Dark Souls classes or 
even adapting any of those kind of games where it's a little bit more free form. I know people have tried to put classes to like Fallout before. I, I, I don't know. Have you gone over the Fallout 2D20 variant? I, I've seen bits and pieces of it. I'm like, this looks weird. Uh, I I haven't yet. Because um. it's based off the war game, apparently, more than anything, which was also a completely bizarre thing, but it was motor based in Boston, but they have Frank Horrigan as a special character for some reason, because nope. we live in Clown Town. If some, if uh, though you you know what's you know what's the one part of Fallout that would be the that would be the most natural place to do a war game. Hmm. New Vegas. New Vegas could work pretty well. Now I know it's not canon anymore, but bring back the Midwest Brotherhood. Give me Fallout tactics, baby. Uh, that would be a great place for another war game, or even just the Caesar con. You know the Caesars. You know conflicts of the tribes, but like. New Vegas in general would be a great place for role playing game, but they, but I know um, Bethesda and in turn Modiphius and all those, they want to focus more on Boston because Fallout Four is the most recent thing, and Fallout Four is Boston, the Commonwealth. I and... also, I also think they're probably salty that they're probably salty about how Obsi how um, Obsidian made a be made a better game than they did. The, the issue with it, <laughs> and I, I, I can rant, I can, I can talk about. All out in various ones, and I will still. This is my controversial opinion. My very controversial opinion. Fallout New Vegas has a worse story than Fallout Three or Four. Uh, but here's the here's the thing. Fallout New Vegas has an infinitely better set of themes than either of those games, which makes it a better like better not narrative necessarily, because New Vegas doesn't have a story really. New Vegas' story is go kill Benny, things happen. Uh, and I think that's... I think those that that kind of setting, like New Vegas, really does fit more for like an RPG than the really strict storyline of 4, for example. Because the entirety of Fallout 4 is about you, the lone survivor. Is that, is that what the, I can't remember. It's not lone survivor. But the lone person who does all the things. And like, the... Um, the synth, what are they, the Institute. Mm -hmm. The Institute is built around you, very specifically, the main character of Fallout 4, because of father and stuff. It's like, this character has no personal, no, has no, like, exterior people around him, except you, the main character. Fallout 3, for example, like, the Capital Wasteland sucks. It's a terrible place. It is, the entire place is just built for you to go on your particular storyline quest. New Vegas, though, if you weren't there, if the courier just got shot in the head and died, things would still happen. Things were still in motion, and everyone does have connections to other people, even those, like, really tied to your storyline, like Benny, where it's like, Benny had his own agenda. If you, you showing up when he was like, what in the goddamn? It's like, you could actually set a campaign. If someone were to say, hey, we're doing a Fallout campaign, New Vegas, this is the pitch, I'd be like, Hell yeah, let's go. I'm going to play a ghoul because I try to play a ghoul in every Fallout game I'm in. Uh, give me a ghoul option, Bethesda. Give me the, the option to play a ghoul and I will be a happy, happy camper. But uh, it's... I think like adapting like Fallout to any kind of game, any anything, is so uniquely complicated because there is a lot of RPG mechanics in it. I think... Here's the weird thing. I think adapting RPG games to the tabletop is harder than adapting other games in some respects because you feel you feel compelled to like use their systems for it uh fallout is a special case because of its relationship with gurps <laughs> yeah and i know i've had to use a lot of fallout math in the project i'm working on now just because it was like actually there but i think like it that was also like the weird thing with pillars of eternity have you ever gone over the pillars of eternity tabletop game I think br briefly, but I but um not but not as much as I not as much as I'd like because it right is a completely different animal than Pillars of Eternity because Pillars of Eternity is a pretty classic CRPG. Like it makes it's, sense of how everything works. It's an ARPG. 
the weird wait, wait, thing no, is. Wait, I'm think. I'm sorry. I was thinking of. I had some stuff crosswired. Never, never mind. <laughs> yeah, pill- yeah. Good old Pillars of Eternity. Pretty classic CRPG from Obsidian. Mm-hmm. The RPG is a bastard child of Burning Wheel. I made a character who had no combat ability. He just knew art really well. There's like a full life path system in it. There's very extensive different mechanics for a bunch of different things. And it's, I look at it being like, you could make this game into anything else. And I do not see in any respect outside of the names of this being Pillars of Eternity. And I found that to be really interesting. I'm curious about your opinion. Like when you're adapting a work, does it even need to be vaguely related to the core premise? Like, in the, it's kind of weird to say, but like, the Pillars of Eternity game is so radically different in its approach and its ideas than the actual game. Like, this is the analogy that this is the analogy that I've that I've used. I am less interested in adapting the Elder Scrolls than I am in adapting Tamriel. I, I would, I would be, le- for, and this this is the re- this is before we went live. I had t- I had I had done it, I had done this similar analogy when it comes to um, stuff like Avatar Legends or the Power Rangers RPG or the or the like. Adapt adapting the the game the game and the game's mechanics. I think it, I think would only I think would only be necessary in so f- in so far as if is if there there's specific um, specific motifs that that are t- that are tied to the setting and tied to the mechanics. Um, an example of this, and I I don't know if anybody's adapted into TRPG, but I'll use tyr- I'll use stuff like tyranny or arcanum. The the mecha- there is a there is a very clear line between the me- between the mechanics and the narratives that that they take place in. Um, just I'll use Arcanum as an example. I do f- I do find Arcanum to be very very underrated as far as CRPG goes. I love Arcanum; it's great stuff. But kill all gnomes. If you uh. if you dis- if you lean your the the amount of time you spend on either either magic or technology is going to open or close certain doors in terms of how you interact with the world. Like if you if if you have yeah. a lot of magic stuff, you may be forced to be on the back to be on the back of the train, or you may not even be allowed to be on the train, but you have the opportunity to to, um, t- to fast travel with magic. There's al- there's also the place there's also the fact that some pl- that um some places won't even won't even have you around because of because of how technology is meant to uh, Mandalore put it best technology is meant to work in a certain way all the damn time. Magic doesn't really have this. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Like, I think like adapting certain settings or certain even ideas work a lot better than others. Because like Arcanum would be like, yeah, this is going to be a great CRPG or like great TRPG. Sorry. Mm-hmm. And you think about it, and you sit down, and it's like, how would I do this properly? Like, is there like a magic score rating? Because a lot of the time, it's not even necessarily like the world, like, oh, well, your magic rating is a 10, so this occurs. It's more like, you're a wizard, this person does not want to let you on the damn train, because you're going to kill everyone on it, so no, go away. Yeah. It's like, the, all right, like... The... I do I do recall, do, I do recall doing, um, doing, Arca- doing Arcanum built and build... Building it around the cipher system at one point, and that could work. I don't like the cipher system, but I understand how it could work. And like, beca- because and beca- because it it already ha- something something that I al- I always check whenever I'm doing these sort of annotations is has has somebody gone has somebody gone down the same path I have already, and how and how did they go about it, and what can I do? And the reason I use the cipher system in this instance is because you have you have you have a very clear line between essentially ma- essentially magic, physical, and skill. Um, 
And if if you don't if you don't want to use Cipher for this, you could use say Warrior Rogue and Mage for for this and, yeah, get, I, and come to I the same you. conclusion. So in the in this regard, all that all that it have for the train, uh, uh, you could it could, it could be if if any part if any if any party member has a magic rating that's a, that's above X, then they can't then they can't go on the train. Um, and it's it's art and that's. That would be something that's already built. That's already built into the mechanics, and especially, especially since in in Cipher, the in in its original form in Numenera, you essentially had warrior, rogue, mage as the as the types through the um, through, through yeah the, the Glide, Numenera Glide, had Nano and ja and Jack, um, yeah, and. Warrior, Rogue, and Mage just has it that instead of instead of the standard attributes, Warrior, Rogue, and Mage are literally your the names of your core three attributes. It's tech. It's technically a classless system. Now, th in this in the same in this in that same vein, I do rem I do if some if um I do remember one. When it came to wanting to do something like, say, Mass Effect, which I was asked if I would if I would tackle that at one point, um, I'd I'd said that I, I'd said that it can, I'd said that it can be done, but but um, trying to em trying to emulate the trying trying to emulate the the um co the combat loop with it, within it would end up being a problem, and I've I've especially had this problem when it, whenever it comes to doing games that have games that have gone through multiple iterations and multiple um multiple get multiple mechanic changes um it's is a case of because if i if i was to be asked to do a to do a dark souls themed one i would say okay let's look at dark souls one two three and elden ring we have to come up with a through line that goes that goes through all that goes through all four and and build it once we have that Rome that all roads lead to build around that. Um, I've mentioned before, but I am wor I am working on doing so doing something like that with um, Final Fantasy. I do not envy you on that front. Uh, um, we're actually a lot we're actually a lot farther along on, on that particular pro on that particular project. We're clo we're close to being done for but the thing is. We made it. We made a couple conscious decisions to avo to avoid certain problems. One of them was we are not interested in focusing on any one entry. A lot of people will focus on six. They'll focus on seven. They'll focus on a broad idea of this of the SNES era or something like that. That is not what we did. Um, I will note that we ended it ended up starting as an extensive hack of Legend system just to, just to see if I could do it and then. Go and then going further and further with it, and there were specific reasons why I used that one. One, I really like the track system that it has. We just did our own spin on it, where e where each each um job is its own, is its own track instead of e instead of a class being th being three tracks that are already set. Two, um the weapon the weapon design that's built that's built around tags. Meant that we could meant that we didn't need to have a weapon list, since I felt if we put a weapon list, we would end up playing catch up because there because there's because um you'd have the issue of the of the exotic of the exotic weapon problem, but you'd also have the fact that say a, say a game comes along in the future that has some sort of unique weapon that ends up standing out, well inevitably somebody'd ask how would you adapt the, how would you adapt that weapon, and it would, and it, and we'd have to, and it would have to be made from scratch and then ha and then possibly have to do the same thing again in a few years <laughs> so that was the that was the interesting thing when I noticed in uh, Omega Fantasy which I actually quite enjoyed Omega Fantasy it had its flaws but I did enjoy it uh, is that all the weapons were effectively the special weapons you had Miramasa in there and you would just level Miramasa up effectively. And I thought that game was very fascinating, but a lot of the Final Fantasy RPGs have kind of gone over have been, as you said, kind of more focused on the Final Fantasy VI, VII, and VIII era. Sometimes you get nine, the unfortunate bastard child of the, the Final Fantasy world. 
Uh, I was, you even I was, get Blitzball in there. Um, the, those, those kind of things are nice, but the the other reason I wanted to I wanted to do I wanted to take this the approach that I did is I didn't is. The analogy I used is I am not interested in giving somebody a Lego set. I'm interested in giving them the blue bucket we all had as kids. And if you didn't have it, you knew somebody who did that yeah. bucket of random Legos. And the reason the reason for that is there is I did is I didn't want to I didn't want to bring in the assumption that you have to do a certain st- a certain style of fantasy. I I mentioned in some of the writing that two two games in the franchise that have settings that I find interesting are ten and twelve. Now this is where somebody would go. Why are you bringing up ten and twelve? Those ga- those two su- those two suck. They're nowhere they're nowhere near good as good as six. And like fuck off with that. Mm-hmm. Well, they're fuck yeah they're wrong in that regard. First ten off, is amazing. First off, <laughs> fuck the Grogs. But it has to do with the fact that. Both of them are do are have a have a setting that does not fall within the uh, what people believe fantasy is supposed to be. Ten, they they just they outright stated that ten was meant to have a very Asian feel, which it certainly does, and in particular the Philippine Islands. One could even one could even say that sin is analogous to the to some of the hurricanes and typhoons that hit a lot of those island areas in East Asia. Yeah. Um, 12 is vi- is um do ha- very much has it's has a lot of ties to the fertile crescent in ter- in terms of the way it presents itself. Es- especially when it comes to env- environment and in some regard character design. It is v- is very much akin to to pl- to to the um mid- to the Middle East. And in doing that, in doing that, it demonstrates that you don't necessarily have to be doing Western Western Europe for for your approach. And anyone who claims that you have to be doing that, um, clearly clearly didn't clearly um, didn't understand what Sakaguchi had had said all the way back in in during his during his tenure that he didn't that he. He out he outright state he outright stated that there was that there was nothing stopping FF from from be, from being something other than an RPG. He in, in, even he even he had even fought to have um, FF eleven actually have the Roman numeral in it in its title. The higher ups wanted it to just be FF online, and he was like, "No, we're not doing that." The 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 approach that we took instead was utilizing the mythos to build that blue bucket of Legos. You know the you know things like crystals, things things like recurring monsters like bombs and cactuars, having a guy named Sid, having <laughs> having summons that sh- having summons or the names of them that show up that show up frequently, having having certain types of jobs and certain types of abilities. These things that are that keep recurring. The things that make Final Fantasy Final Fantasy. Yeah, I know a lot of people. When sixteen came out, a lot of people tried to act like it wasn't because they because they wanted to yell Game of Thrones fanfic because of the fact that um, the the writers had had used Game of Thrones as part of their as part of their study for what they wanted to do. And I was, and I, I I found the I found the idea of it of that making it a Game of Thrones fanfic a bit ridiculous because. That's no different than say, um, Harv Bennett binging the original Star Trek series when he was producing Wrath of Khan, which he which he did which he did do yeah. because he he hadn't seen yet when he stepped onto the producer role, he hadn't he hadn't done anything he hadn't done anything or or had even watched any of Star Trek before that, so he binged the whole series, and took and took notes all the while. This is the same principle, um. A long time ago, I did something similar when I was asked if I would run a Sailor Moon camp- campaign for a friend. Oh, jeez! I did it. Be- I did it because I owed him- because I owed him a favor, and I o- and I always stick to my word. But at the time, I had only seen like one or two episodes when Deke was handling things, so I ended up I ended up saying, "Okay, if you want me to do this, I'm going to need to do it right. I'm going to need some tapes." 
It's like, okay, okay, what, okay, what else, is, what other souls do you need? All of it. Yeah, like, give me the entire thing. Yeah, don't even. I got two commissions coming in: one for a pre cure game and one for a Sailor Moon game. Literally right after one another. So <laughs> it's like, all right, all right. I guess I'm gonna watch the entire first, you know, two seasons of pre cure and then watch the entire, you know, time of Sailor Moon to get the right idea in this. I'm like, all right, I feel confident in this. God help me. <laughs> like, <laughs> And I, I um, I do, I do find it kind of interesting that that um uh, that other um, console style RPGs don't don't have don't have as many TTRPG adaptations as Final Fantasy. And I th I think I think the big reason for that is it would be very difficult to it would be very difficult to divorce what's the um the the setting from the the setting or the story from those kept from those characters like yeah exactly you also have the um god what were they called the remembers that's not it i know that's not it it was the, the original the returners the returners you had them like it's weird when you really look at like kind of like the history because that's what i like doing i like looking at kind of the background to a lot of these games and you notice that most Final Fantasy RPGs, a Mega Fantasy, the Final Fantasy tabletop game, and a couple other ones, all have people involved from the original's Returners group in some way. And it's like, I think that ha plays a factor in it. Uh, but I think, like, the thing, even you, you even see things like Fabula Ultima, which I still don't like, and I'll fight everyone who owned that, who, like, borrow a lot from Final Fantasy. And you see a lot of games that borrow from Final Fantasy because it's such a prominent franchise it's not like this people like to think like oh final fantasy it's it's the big it's the big rpg and you know people then like okay what kind of you know, what's your favorite final fantasy game and they're like i don't know i've never I've, played it <laughs> one th <laughs> although one thing i will one thing i will say is that in regard in regards to talking about console style rpgs if you if um if if you if you open up that conversation and all that you can bring up to me is Chrono Trigger and Final Fantasy VI, you are basic bitch. See, you... I I'll be like, man, I love Final Fantasy VI, but I'm also like, Final Fantasy V was amazing, and everyone should play Final Fantasy V. Uh, and tactics, just play tactics. This is a threat. This is like <laughs> this. It's it's not an for me. This is this is not an issue of what of what my favorite is, but more of people more of people going with the um with the uh, with the obvious. There it, was it. It reminds me of um. There was a God, not Ja Rule. I can't remember. It was a rapper I know. He was talking about this, and it was like, oh, you know, you get all these kids saying, you know, like, what's your favorite albums? And they're naming people like Tupac, and they're naming all these really famous you know songs and rappers i mean it's like kid you don't know what that is like you're just naming what's popular or you're naming like the things that people are going to assume are popular i mean like what do you like what's the thing that you are really into and if, if some, that's why if somebody br if somebody brought that up with um when, when it came to hip-hop the the stuff that i would be naming isn't isn't tupac or anything like that i'd be naming stuff like um psyche origami um so yeah no that's what this guy was kind of that's kind of what the the guy was talking about was it's like you have so many people kind of name what like the safe options so it's like oh well i'm i'm cool i've played final fantasy 6 i'm like okay like what else, like what do you like though like what's your favorite final fantasy what's your favorite you know console rpg and then you start getting the real answers and then you start getting some kind of weirder ones Kind of like the other day, I was browsing on. I was browsing Twitter, and um, you want to know what now has technically like a, a semi-official game? Wild Arm. Hell yeah, baby! Wild Arms is finally getting a tabletop role-playing game entirely in Japanese. Oh, but, fu oh, fuck me! Yeah, no, I saw that. I'm like, hell and I, yeah! And I am Wild I Arms. Am, I am a massive <laughs> fucking mark for Wild Arms. I did a whole episode of the podcast talking yeah, about I, it. I saw that the other day. I was like, "This go like this is a Wild Arms RPG, JTRPG." Some guy was like, "I'm gonna do it." I'm like, "Hell yeah!" And it's like, because I thought about it, I'm like, "You don't see Wild Arms out here. You see games inspired by Final Fantasy. You see some Chrono Triggers. 
you see a lot of your your standard gotcha stuff looking at you fa- looking at you fabulous fucking grand blue fantasy but you see a lot of that and it's like i'm curious of like what would some of those games kind of like what you know some of those console you know old console rpgs go you know actually look like but i'm thinking of like a lot of people who make the console rpg trpgs haven't either played them or know about them or they kind of only know the popular ones and things like that when we were and... developed when we were developing our project which we co- which we're called which we've codenamed ff legend um we ended up go- we ended up going through everything that we that we could get our hands on to get to get a feel for it and brother zan and i are already already are already are massive um Massive, massive RPG fans in both tabletop and vi- and video game, and the, but the appro- the approach that we ha- that we had from the get go was as as I mentioned built building a sandbox, which meant that we had to look through a wide pool. I'd say, I'd say a, a lot of pe- a lot of people who make these, um, they're they're familiar they're familiar with a handful, but that but that's really that's really it. Um, it is fu- it is funny you mentioned um, Fabula Ultima because I do plan on reviewing it in the future. I ha- I <clears> have been developing a script. I've been I've go- I'm going into it completely blind. What I will but what I will note is something that did make something that really made me cringe was ha- was how was how people was how it was at was how it was building itself as a. T, a, a TT JRPG, and I would I would see people apply the same thing to the marketing of that and yes. um, break. Uh, here's and, the thing with Fabula Ultima that I found very fascinating, and the thing about it that annoyed the shit out of me with it, because I love Ryutama, love that Ryu, love Ryutama. Fu uses Ryutama's kind of core idea, core system, effectively, almost one to one. The weird thing with Fabula Ultima, I'm not trying to sway your opinion, but I am, but because I hate this game, is that it has no identity. It is not a it is not Wild Up. It is not Final Fantasy. It's not Grand Blue Fantasy. It's not it's any trying of to, these it's ones. trying to be a kitchen sink, is what you're telling me. It's effectively if you put every every idea idea of what a JRPG is, and I specifically say a JRPG, if you were to Google right now JRPG and put every single Google image inside of a game and then, you know, inside of a pot and just blended it all together. It's that, without having anything to say, like, this is you. It's like, oh, of course we have a Dark Knight class. I'm like, why? Why do you have a Dark Knight class? Uh, because JRPGs have Dark Knight classes. I'm like, Wild Arms doesn't. I love Wild Arms. Bring, where, where's that? Well, you can play the, the Engineer class. I'm like, what if my fan setting doesn't have this? Well, just don't allow it. But it's there in the book, and it should be applied to everything. Because you're, it's everything. It's everything at once, but it's nothing at the same time. I can go into its mechanics this and is, you know this, why I hate the mechanics. Is, but the the funny the reason I find that funny is since you brought up Ryutama is Ryutama has a has a very even though some people might look at it as as be, as being as being JRPG ish. I've I've, ar- I've already I've already mentioned in the past, and I did a whole video on why I hate the phrase JRPG. Um, I'm not sure not sure if you saw not sure if you saw that the 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 um bo- the long and short of it is that is I hate the I hate the phrase as a genre title because it does not def- it 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 is it's not a title it, it doesn't define anything it's just an RPG from Japan and that could mean a, a plethora of things. Yeah, like, I mean if we're gonna the- if we're gonna go that route, um, and I've done this to be a troll. Then that means Dark Souls is a JRPG, and nobody's going to argue that. Exactly. Like my big thing is like why I separate JTRPG. Why I kind of put TRPG and JTRPG. I don't know if I mentioned is, it is when because, we were recording or not. Uh, it's because <laughs> oh no. the now that is that is an exception to the rule because the because the tabletop scene in Japan evolved in a different way from the from the rest of the world um, drastically to the point where putting the two together is going to be different. That's why people look at Ryutama. I I have people like look at Ryutama being like, well, we tried to run a campaign with it and it wasn't very fun after a while. I mean, let's like, okay, how long are your sessions? Oh, well, they're four hours. I'm like, that's wrong. 
do not run a four-hour Ryutama camp session. But this he, is, <laughs> that's not he, how this is to be designed. But here, here's the thing, though. Um, Ryutama is cl is clearly drawing a lot of its inspirations from some of the more fa from the more fantasy adjacent oh, yeah. work that Hayao Miyazaki has do has done. Um, I'd say I'd say in particular stuff stuff like um, Castle in the Sky. Not in t not in terms of tech, but in yeah. terms of the in terms of the vast world. I w I know s I was tempted to bring up Princess Mononoke, but n not really. It's not go it's not really the same kind of. I story. see I see the idea. I see. I'd say I'd say, I'd say, as, it, I'd say as well. Um, um, now now You know, both of them having these well, hu both these having these huge worlds. But the other thing is. I jokingly said that it that it's it's got some commonalities with the Oregon Trail. The journey is the big oh, yeah. is the bigger part of 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 Ryutama. The journey and the seasons, I'd say, are part of the bigger themes. Exactly, but those like, are things that you can build around. One of the things that like I had to kind of uh, bring up, especially not I had to bring up in the the stream, not necessarily the video, is the actual place where Ryutama was created, kind of more in a meta sense, is very interesting because it's by, effectively by the guy who owns a gaming cafe in in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. It's called Mandrako. And for a while, most of his food menu was Ryutama theme. Because he wrote the game because people would come to his shop and he wanted people to stay. So what do you do? Well, here's a really cozy travel RPG for people who have never played a TRPG before. And it, you, you say, like, oh, every game... I remember you posted Twitter, like, oh, every game can be someone's first. And that's really interesting with Ryutama, because it's like, this could be every single person involved in this group first time playing. So it's like, well, here's the Ryujin. And I've had people say, I hate the Ryujin, because the Ryujin is, like, this weird DMPC. I think it's dumb. I think it's that. I mean, like, you under... Like, the entire purpose of this, the entire purpose of the Ryujin is to help you t like effectively teach someone how to like you know DM because if you've never DM'd before and you've never really explored the concept of RPGs you do need someone to kind of tell you and then you have to like kind of have the Japanese like writing thing have how the Japanese st game structure is built around it the fact that you're paying for a table is very different and the it shifts everybody's i would say it shifts people's perspective on it if you look at it like that and that's kind of like the weird thing, you know, kind of bringing in, you know, full circle with back to Fabula Ultima. That I find fascinating with Fabula Ultima, where it tries to say we are now like D and D now. We're like we expect you to have dozens and dozens of sessions to play and to get up the max, you know, to get up to your level one hundred or whatever, and you start at level five. You know, oh, we expect you to have dozens of, you know, dozens of hours of play. I mean, like Ryutama is not designed for that. A lot of JRPGs are not really designed. JTRPGs are not really designed for long-term play because it can't. Like you can't afford that. They're more one-shot focused. Like I, I'm going to have to give a presentation next year at a local con about this. So I've been, I've had to like draw up like a full thing about it. I, I've yeah. given this speech about a dozen times at this point. Yeah, but. and now, gr granted, one granted one could one could argue that what I'm doing is is kitchen sinky, but it's ri but um i don't th i don't think what i'm i don't think what i'm doing is because you you mentioned dark knight it's like what they have a dark knight because jrpg i have a dark knight because dark knights have been have been an established um exactly. character, like, char character archetype since i four. think there is the thing is with there's two kinds of kitchen sinks you can get the kitchen sink that is everything and it smells like shit or you can get a kitchen sink from a good from a good meal you just had. It's in the sink, everything's there, but it's like, okay, like this clearly is working together because there's a core focus there, not, hey, we threw in legitimately every single idea and concept we could into one thing, and we're just now clapping our hands and being like, here's everything. This is what you wanted, right? It's like, no, like, <laughs> I wanted, and you know, like what you're doing is effectively just saying we're taking Final Fantasy, we're taking all the core concepts of Final Fantasy, we're taking all these core... The correct trope t term would be trope at this point. Uh, the correct tropes and ideas like that, and adapting that into the game. Like, that's fine, my book. And we're, we're not writing... I'm not, I'm not writing a, a, a setting... 
um, to that end beca because I am operating under the assumption that anybody picking this picking this up is going to be familiar on some regard with FF. The big battle cry that I had that I've had was um, customization. Um, because I've and I I know somebody might say, well, what? Well, if if you wanted customization, why not go full hero system? Because going full hero system creates analysis paralysis. I pref there <laughs> I find. I oh, find yeah. it to be far more interesting to have the instead instead of instead of going f there's the there's this idea that you have to go either full free form or go class based. I am an advocate for going archetype based. And what I mean by that is it's not a question of what can you do, but what are you better at? I've been drifting more toward archetype based for some of my games though. I am notorious for saying, "Well, here's a bunch of points. Uh, make your character now." I'm like and you know, going back to some of my older games, I have two I have two reduxes in the works right now, and it's like, oh notepad. Oh innocent twenty twenty notepad. How foolish you are. <laughs> How foolish. So you ended up making the same mistake that a lot that I saw a lot of people making in two thousand three. <laughs> it's... And or or even worse, the mistake that um Shad and Jaza made when I looked at Cogent. It's some of those early games that I wrote, it was kind of interesting because I was so paranoid about restriction, like restricting people. I'm like, I don't want to restrict anybody. Like, I am, I'm a big advocate for that. And a couple of the people I was rolling with at that point were more options, more ideas, stuff is good. And like, slowly over time, my things have been, I, my development style has shifted to be a little bit more, um, focused if that makes sense like you're gonna get what you want mm -hmm. and here's a bunch of options you want however i'm gonna tell you how to do it i'm gonna give you what you want kind of thing like what do you what are you actually looking for here what do you what i know you want this anime girl adventure with you know you know harem adventure time i know you want this use this and it's going to be a lot easier for you here's this here's what you actually want and here's how i'm going to direct you how to make what you want mm. uh without having to rely too heavily on classes because god i hate writing abilities uh <laughs> truly the worst um uh and admittedly, some of the things that I have in it are are cases where there were certain niches that I felt were were um un were unfilled. For example, there isn't a there isn't a dervish job in any Final Fantasy, but I wanted there I wanted there to be the option for a more speed based berserker instead of a, instead of a power based one. Um, yeah, I mean that's the thing is you even if you see like oh here's a like oh this isn't really here. They do sometimes show up because of like, oh, you're playing like you have a berserker kind of character in one of these games, so it hits hard. You always want to give him items or abilities or things to speed him up really fast. And sometimes he does turn into a glass cannon of like, oh, cool, Waka's hitting for 800 million damage. He has 5 HP. Go get him, Waka. <laughs> Go yeah. get him. Oh, oh, he's dead again. Damn it. And then there, then there was some things like what I did with the fight with the fighter. That was that was just me wanting to, wanting to wanting to make some wanting to avoid certain traps. Like the issue that I've always had with the f with the fighter as a as an archetype, the whole he's good with weapons as the selling point is players. Most players are not going to be, are not going to be able to really connect with really take advantage of that because people are going to largely stick with. With one with one or two ways that they equip that character and not venture out of it, somebody who starts with a great sword is not going to not going to not going to mid campaign switch to sword and board all that often. That's not to say it doesn't happen; it just doesn't happen often enough. Exactly. So, and then I then I looked at um, Firion's design in Dissidia while I was while I was doing research, and yeah, and saw you, his... you even went to the city, jeez. <laughs> yeah. I told I told you I'm going. We went we went all the way into the mobile games for research. That's how far we went. Oh God, I I do not envy you on that front. I mean, though, I had to I I had to reference the city a lot for another game. Though, I was like, oh God. Though with, with with some of the mobile games, I'm I'm like I sh I'm like some of these I should spend some more time with. Like like say, I th even the, even if it's got gotcha hell, I'd be willing to at least look at Brave Exodus and um, Dimensions. I feel like I I feel like I. 
I slept I slept on that. Um but the but the the approach the reason I bring up Furion is because of the whole him having 10 different weapons thing that he has in Dissidia. And I I was like, "You know what? That's the approach we're going to take. If you're picking the fighter, it's because you want all the weapons. You get you get more weapons at the you get more weapons at the start, and you can switch between them more easily than er and anyone else. M more weapons, more items, more things, and more. I used that to, to um, to do to do the opposite when I made the we when I made the weapon master. Instead, instead of bringing in a bunch of weapons, they're just really, really, really good at getting the most out of one particular weapon. Yeah, exactly. I'd, I'd already, I'd already built a, I'd already built the tag system for weapons by that point. So all that I had, all they had was that there's some extra benefits based on tags that the weapon master has access to that nobody else does. That w that was the, um, that was the that was the mindset, but I, but um, it's been it's been an interesting ride, and I do I do want to wish you the best of luck with some with some of the um, projects that you've been commissioned to do. Yeah, I've had uh, currently the next major commission. If things go according to plan, I don't know if you've ever heard of a little J uh, Japanese roguelike game called Alona. Uh, I have. Yeah, it's going to be the Alona TRPG. So that that'll be that'll be interesting to to do. Um, I, I have everything's there. Everything is set up. Uh, I played the game for a while just to kind of get a feel for it, and it's like. Oh God! Oh no! All right, I can do this. Help! Get me out of here. <laughs> but it'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. But with with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. And I will have to find a way to get to get you back to get you back in down the road. All right. Yeah. Well, you know where to reach me. I'll I'll, I'll pop in anytime I can, mm -hmm. or when you want me. Yep. So, with and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers, present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. Bye. <laughs>